Okay, I am live. Okay, welcome YouTube and to the people that are on Zoom. It looks like right now we have 30 people participating on Zoom and we have 11 people and growing by the minute participating on YouTube. So for the people that are on Zoom, uh, you can send me a chat message and you can put that right into the Zoom group chat. I'll be able to see that coming in. Uh, for people watching live on YouTube, if you look at the link that I put in the description, you can actually uh, send me a message via Poll EV, and you can do that live. So you have two ways to actually reach out to me live. Uh, I'll go through the lesson. You know, it'll probably take about 15 minutes to kind of go through the lesson. And then just like I've been doing in the past, I'll start taking some questions from the broader group. So the question from today came from two Emma Ks. So both of my Emma Ks asked a similar question that was about storms, and I kind of combined it into two, like the two questions into, into one little presentation. So I had the two, the original questions were, what was the biggest storm I've ever personally been in? Um, and then the second question was, um, has there ever been a Category 5 hurricane in the U.S.? So I took those and I decided to make a, a top five video. So the top five video that I came up with were the five most powerful storms in American history. So this is a question that's really difficult to answer because there's so many ways that you could possibly describe a storm and what's the most powerful. And so I picked five different categories uh, for ways to describe it. For people that are on Zoom, um, if you haven't already, take a look at the group chat and you can see the thing that I put to everyone. So if you wanna follow along with the slides, you can, you can click on things in real time. Um, if you just wanna be surprised and have me describe it to you, you don't have to click on those slides, you can check them out after, but I think it's pretty cool to, uh, to follow along with the slides. All right, so let's dive right in. Category number one uh, is gonna be biggest snowstorm. So I actually, I found two different ways to answer this. Uh, biggest snowstorm ever from one single storm. So there's a lot of ways to look at this over a season, over 24 hours, over 48 hours, or over a single storm was, um, this was just over one storm. A storm snowed for six days in California at the Shasta Ski Bowl. And that storm was, it, it produced 189 inches of snow, 189 inches. So that's almost 16 feet of snow. And I heard a person describe this as if you took the tallest person in NBA history and you made a wax sculpture of them and you had them balance the wax sculpture of them on top of their head, it still wouldn't be tall enough um, to make that amount of snow. So it's a totally crazy amount of snow. Um, Shasta gets insane amounts of snow every year. And it's like one of, it's one of the snowiest places on earth. But this particular year was, was unbelievable. And so this was, um, this was in 1959 when they got this one storm that dropped almost 200 inches of snow. And you should also know that when you have really big amounts of snow, you can create really, really big avalanches. So this is a, this is a picture of an avalanche uh, coming down Mount Shasta. This is after the fact. Uh, apparently when these happen at Mount Shasta, it creates avalanches with 30 to 40 foot walls of snow moving down the mountain. Um, and I even have a video of what that looks like in British Columbia, right near where Mount Shasta is. So take a look at this. So this is, this is a video of an avalanche triggered out in British Columbia. Now they will do this intentionally so that, um, so that the avalanches don't happen randomly and, and startle people. They'll actually trigger avalanches to get them to release their snow. And so you can see the scale of this going down the mountain and just an absolute devastating wall of snow that just takes out everything in its path. So I, I'm so impressed by the power of snow and need to think what would 15 feet of snow in one storm cause for a massive avalanche? Because this wasn't even the record snowfall. This was, this was an avalanche that they triggered on a year that they did have just a lot of snow. Okay, so, and um, for people that are raising their hands in here, um, if you send me messages into the, the Zoom group chat, I'm gonna get to all of your questions as we get further into this video. So I appreciate that you guys are wanting to, uh, to interact. And I think, it's, I think it's probably gonna be a little easier if we uh, just do all of those questions at the end. But so keep typing your questions in here and I will get to it. Uh, I wanted to show you what Mount Shasta looks like too. This is pretty cool. So this is from the top of Mount Shasta. 
And so this is a guy that posted their video of hiking it. Now this is a mountain that just gets like unbelievable amounts of snow every single year because it's really close to the Pacific Ocean. And so moist air comes off of the Pacific Ocean and then just dumps on top of Northern California um, onto this mountain in particular. So a lot of people will ski it, a lot of people will hike it. Uh, it's just an amazing place to go. And it is hikeable, but you do you do need to take some some pretty insane precautions to be able to uh, avoid the avalanches, but also just to make sure that that you're being safe with the weather that they have at the top. All right, so that that is number one um, way of answering this question. I'm going to show you another different way of answering this question for biggest snowstorm, and we've got one that actually did hit the East Coast. So this is another another way of saying what is the biggest storm. The blizzard of 93, um, which I was actually alive for, that produced the most total snow in one storm. So the National Weather Service has looked at this and they have they've uh, decided that if we totaled up all of the snow from this storm, we would have gotten about 13 cubic miles of snow. So imagine like an area that's one mile wide by one mile long by one mile high. That's how much snow fell in this blizzard. Um, it was enough that, I, I did out the math on this one, uh, it was enough to bury the amount of, of uh, bury Massachusetts to a depth of about six and a half feet. Oh, and I, uh, I just realized that I accidentally muted Miss Bonner, and I want to give her the chance to, uh, to be able to talk if she needs to. So I'm unmuting. And sorry about that. Yeah, I'm unmuted. Thank you. Sorry, that was my fault. No, no worries. All right, so now now you can chime in, and it's not just me talking. Um, and I I hope you do. So, all right. So this is cool. This this snowstorm, which happened in 1993, um, was apparently as powerful as a Category Three hurricane. So it was basically a Category Three hurricane that fell as snow. And for people that are checking out the slides here, if you open this link. Um, the National Weather Service has a great uh, page about the blizzard of 93. It was March of 1993, and it basically just leveled the whole East Coast. So they have these cool satellite images here. Um, they have the, the pressures that were recorded. These are pressure levels that you would typically see in hurricanes that were being measured, but during a winter storm. Um, maximum wind gust, again, this is hurricane force wind. To be a hurricane, to be category one hurricane, it's a it's 73 mile per hour wind. So we're talking about um, category hurricane, category one hurricane level winds, but with snow instead of rain. They have the snow totals map here, um, and they have they've got so many great resources here, satellite images that are really beautiful. Uh, but check out that link because there's some cool stuff, and they have some weather reports at the time. So definitely definitely give that a look because it looks really cool. Oh, yeah. I believe so, I was in eighth grade during that storm. Oh, that was when you were in eighth grade? I think so. <laughs> okay, I don't really remember it, though. Yeah, there's, um, there's some really good video footage of the time, and it looks good in old school. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. No, no, I, hey, I, was, I was alive for this one, too. So, you know, we, uh, the, the footage at the time is pretty fun. And, and you can look it up. Actually, the footage from the Weather Channel looks really funny because of how much the Weather Channel has evolved since 1993. But, right, but it's pretty yeah. cool. I will say that I was driving to Florida one year, and we were maybe a little past Pennsylvania, and there was a snowstorm, and they only got about an inch or two, but it shut the state down. Oh, wow. Because they just didn't have the snow equipment and the plows and stuff like we have up here. Um, they're just not used to it. So they're, I can remember seeing people trying to get rid of the snow with like brooms and they just didn't have shovels to get rid of stuff. So really when it's hitting more south than up here, it's definitely a bigger issue. So even parts of Georgia got buried with snow and Tennessee mm -hmm. and places that definitely don't have the equipment. So, so yeah, that's a, that's a great point. Um, uh, one question that came in that, um, from Daniela, just I'll do this one live, is did Florida get snow during this? And I'm not sure, but maybe Miss Bonner, if you can look that one up for me, if, um, if Florida got snow during this, because then we'll, we'll have an answer uh, when we get to the Q&A. All right, moving on um, to Mount Washington. Uh, this one was going to be one of my favorites, because this is the place on the earth where they have, uh, sorry, not on the earth anymore, place in the United States still to this day 
where they have the highest directly recorded wind speed ever recorded. So Mount Washington, back in 1934, recorded a wind speed of 231 miles per hour. Um, this is a picture, believe it or not, from 1934. This guy looks like he would fit in in a hipster coffee shop in modern context. Um, and he, he somehow he looks really modern. This is him holding the famous anemometer that recorded this wind of 231 miles per hour. So what that means is um, that that's way faster than any hurricane that we've been able to direct re record. And it's also faster than any tornado that we've been able to directly record. We do have recordings coming from tornadoes that we got from radar that are faster, but this is the only one that we actually have an instrument that was whipping around at 231 miles per hour recording it. Um, so it's the second fastest in the world. There was a, there was a tropical uh, cyclone, which is basically what the, what the Southern Hemisphere calls hurricanes. Um, they often call them typhoons as well in the Pacific, but this, this cyclone in Australia hit 254 miles per hour. And so that beat New Hampshire's record, but still in the, in, it's the hemisphere record, it's the American record, um, and, we, and basically we own it, it's New Hampshire. So here's how this happened. It does not even look that bad. There was a, there was a pretty strong low pressure system centered over the Great Lakes. And then there was a really strong high pressure system centered over the North Atlantic. And as we know from class, air wants to go from areas of high pressure to low pressure. And so the fact that there was a strong high and a strong low, and Mount Washington was sitting directly in between these two, it created a wind current that was whipping but from high to low. And it created these really ridiculous winds. Um, 231 miles per hour is almost like hard to fathom. And to give you a sense, this is what a hundred mile per hour winds look like. A hundred miles per hour winds is enough to like toss you if you jump into the air like he's going to do. That's a hundred. 231 mile per hour winds would literally throw this guy off of the summit and down into the gully. Like this is uh, 230 mile per hour winds is just almost inconceivably powerful of winds. And so uh, that's it right in our own backyard. Um, don't go hiking Mount Washington right now during the um, during the social distancing, because, you know, it's a it's a dangerous hike in um, on an average day. Right now, you don't want to you don't want to get in trouble and have to have the emergency people have to come out and rescue you. Even though you might not be surrounded by other people, activities like going up Mount Washington not a really good idea during social distancing, um, even if you're not going to be around people. So cool story that I learned from this uh, researching this story. They actually built the observatory on the roof. Uh, oh, sorry, on the roof <laughs> on the top of Mount Washington. Back just the year before 1934, so they man they got it just in time to get this record win, um, and they have the full story. If you want to read the full story, it's long, um, but it's pretty cool. This is this is the the construction of it um, when it was first established, and they go through. Here's this really cool hipster dude. Um, you. Isn't that funny? Like he looks so modern. <laughs> he actually does vaguely look like me. I think he does. That is weird. Maybe it's a, like a distant relative or something. The nose and the eyes. I'm, I'm kind of, yeah. yeah, weird. I, I mean, got... if you could have told us that was you, just black and white, we would have believed it. That is weird. Yeah. <laughs> I guess people can respond in the chat if they think that that actually looks like me or not. But this is exactly, I wouldn't have this awesome um, stoic pose that he has holding this. I would be having a big goofy smile holding this anemometer. Um, but Aubrey Halstead. Okay. So... In any case, yeah, he, he looks pretty cool uh, with his anemometer. They have to crank the cables to actually hold that. An anemometer is just um, just holds. Uh, it, it, anemometers measure wind speed, but to measure 230 mile an hour winds, you're gonna have to have some really strong cables to hold that in place, so it so it doesn't blow off. Uh, apparently, it's a mixed bag about whether students think that he looks like me. Some someone said he looks like a weird Tom Brady. Um, I don't know. <laughs> All right, so move, moving on to, uh, to the next piece. Uh, take a look at this next one. Um, next category of powerful storms is going to be, oh, that's great, not gonna load. Let's see if I can uh, reload it here. Part of the storm, and part of this didn't wanna load. Huh, okay, I'm gonna have to hit refresh and hope for the best. 
Good thing um, I'm not maxing out my computer with like 8 million apps running. And uh, I actually did close out my tabs, believe it or not, before doing this. That's amazing. There's yeah. not 100 tabs open? There are not. I tried to close out all the ones that I didn't need. Come on, load. You can do it. There we go. Okay. Most total rainfall. Okay, so the winner for that, another um, uh, very recent storm, Hurricane Harvey, 2017. Uh, Mrs. Bonner and I were talking about this last night, and this is like mind-boggling amount of rain. 60 inches of rain. That's, uh, it's just crazy. So if you think about that, that means that that whole area was covered to a depth of five feet if it was flat ground. The whole area. If it can flow downhill at all, it's just going to pile up and be deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper. Like so crazy so if you are following along on the slides check out this link national weather service has a cool page on harvey um and i do want to say this so mrs bonner and i were talking about this last night too that if you look at the most intense rainfall events um three of the four most intense rainfall events in the united states history have have oh sorry no three for three the last the three most powerful rainfall events in united states history rainfall storms have happened in just the last four years. So, um, and the reason for that, there was a study on it that I was able to find in researching this. Study on it said that extreme events like Harvey are now six times more likely as a result of climate change. So climate change is making this, we can't definitively say that Harvey happened as a result of climate change, but what we can say definitively is that events like Hurricane Harvey are six times more likely now that we have climate change. I'm going to click, um, click this link here that I put in for you all. My favorite website, Null School Earth. And you can go back to 2017 and see what Hurricane Harvey looked like at the time. And the layer that I'm, that I'm looking at here is um, rainfall. So it's three-hour rainfall. And if I click right here, it's saying that every, every three hours, it was dumping four inches of rain in that spot right there. That's so crazy. I'll, I'll let you see what the wind looked like too. The wind at this at this point, um, in the strongest spots here, we're looking at. Uh, I'll put it into miles per hour. The winds that we'd be looking at were. Oop, that's in knots. That doesn't help anyone. Uh, just 70, 70, 80 mile an hour winds. But what was more devastating, it was not the winds necessarily that were the most devastating thing about Harvey. It was the crazy amounts of rain that fell. And I think that um, people that have studied weather in, in, eighth grade, in eighth grade science would know that the reason this storm would be perfect for creating tons of rain is that you're talking about being in a part of the world that has very hot air and it's over the Gulf of Mexico, so there's plenty of moisture available. And that moisture combined with the rising air in the center of this, like here's the, here's the low pressure center right in the middle. So rising warm moist air equals tons and tons of rain. And so here's how this thing moved. And it actually didn't move that quickly. Um, here's how it moved. This is one full day later. It did not move that much in 24 hours. Here's another full day later. Here's another full day later. Here's another full day later. And another full day later. It's basically just sitting there over Texas and dumping absurd amounts of rain. Um, so that's what makes this a really extreme storm. Let me close that out so it doesn't um, overtax my computer. Okay. Storm number two. Uh, so storm number two is going to be the lowest barometric pressure ever recorded. I think that this is as good of a measure as any in terms of um, determining which is the most powerful storm because low pressure systems, which is the type of uh, pressure system you get for a storm, those can be measured in how low was the pressure. So I just showed an area for Hurricane Harvey that was uh, showing the low pressure center. Hurricane Harvey was not, the pressure in the middle was not as low as it was during the all-time winter, Hurricane Wilma in 2005. So the pressure hit 882 millibars or 26.05 inches of mercury. Um, that basically made it the lowest low ever recorded. Um, we think that the reason this happened was that weirdly, 
Um, this hurricane had the smallest eye wall where there's the center of the hurricane of any other hurricane ever in the Atlantic. So basically, the center of the storm was concentrated low pressure. And so it created a low pressure that was a little bit lower than anything else. Um, this satellite view is really cool. And definitely check the link I have at the end of this uh, for a full page on Hurricane Wilma uh, or, or several websites on Hurricane Wilma. It was, it was very cool. But this, this was the lowest low pressure ever recorded. So in comparison, Harvey was 937 millibars. Oh, wow. I didn't realize it was that much higher. And then 27.67 uh, inches of mercury. So significantly lower than Harvey. Yes. And actually, if you notice, you can see how much smaller this storm is than Harvey was. Harvey was taking up a big chunk of the whole Gulf of Mexico. It's a much smaller storm. Thank you for being able to pull up those numbers for me, Ms. Bonner. That's, yeah, sure. that's great. Okay, onward to um, tornadoes. I saved this one for last because tornadoes are, um, are really cool. Um, I've got see, I'm seeing some questions coming into the chat. I'm going to get those in, um, in when we get into the, uh, the Q&A at the end. And those are some really good questions. So thank you for people that are adding questions. Also, I don't know if you can all see it, but we have 38 people on Zoom right now. That's really cool. Um, and then 17 live viewers right now on YouTube as well. So we got a, we got a pretty good turnout for this. Oh, up to 18. It's going up. Um, all right, so the largest tornado. This happened very recently as well, 2013. So it's amazing how many of these storms happened so recently. This storm happened in El Reno, Oklahoma, and it was a width maximum width for the for the tornado of 2.6 miles wide which sounds big but then when i show you this google map you're going to see how big this actually is um now the thing about oklahoma is they have a lot of empty space they have a lot of land that is not uh, heavily populated so the storms don't look quite as big when they're there um, i'm going to show you this and you're going to be like oh my that is that is a really huge tornado Estimated wind speed, look at, keyword, estimated, um, 295 miles per hour. I saw another source that said 305, um, so it's around 300 miles per hour. Now, that would make it faster than the wind on Mount Washington, if you remember. The problem is, this is estimated. They don't have any direct recordings from an anemometer. They got this from Doppler radar. So this is why Mount Washington still owns the record, despite the fact that tornadoes likely have more powerful winds than Mount Washington does. The way that they get this estimation is from uh, one, radar, but two, they actually look at the damage as a way of actually estimating. And so when I, when I say the damage, this, uh, this website from the National Weather Service, they have some pictures of what this damage looked like. I think this website does. And it basically just took houses, they're even like brick houses, and just brought, like, this was a brick house. It, it basically brought it to the ground and took off every single brick on the house. So this is, this is what 300 mile an hour winds can do. Um, it just basically takes out 100% of everything in its past. Look at this car, squashed. Um, so that was probably, that probably happened either due to a downdraft or due to the car just being tossed up in the air so high that it came down. Isn't that crazy, Miss Bonner? Like seeing the, like all the bricks. Yeah, it's completely insane and yeah. scary. It is scary. So let's show let's show them the um, this map that I made. So by the way, this hill is the 18th person on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> so I made this map because I wanted to show you what um, 2.6 miles wide looks like. So I'll start off in Lunenburg. This circle has a diameter of 2.6 miles. So imagine this whole area as a tornado with 300 mile per hour winds. And let's see if I can click and drag it. It's not, it's not wanting to play along. Oh yeah. So imagine it just moves across Fitchburg here, takes out the Walmart and then moves across the whole city of Fitchburg. It, imagine the path of destruction that this would leave. And for the people tuning in from Chelmsford, I put another little um, circle over here by Chelmsford, and you can see this this whole area. If this was a tornado, you can see what it would do to Lowell, to the whole. Like you can see Drum Hill in here. 
So here's here's little baby Drum Hill Plaza. Yeah, the Walmart. <laughs> and the Walmart and the high school and every other neighborhood all 100% all at once. Um, so uh, actually, I, I see Griffin's question I can answer right away. The average tornado lasts about 15 minutes. Um, Ms. Bonner, can you look up how long the El Reno tornado lasted? Um, yeah. I think it's probably gonna be in this page. I think it'll be uh, in here, but that's a, that's a really good question for how long El Reno lasted. Um, oh, there it is. <laughs> 6.03 p.m. to 6.43 p.m. So that's like the world's most terrifying 40 minutes right there. Yeah. Can you imagine? Luckily, like this thing is more... That is farmland. So there, as you were saying, there's not much. The population right. is high. Look at it over Lowell versus all this farmland here. Man, they got so lucky. Look at this town. Mm -hmm. If this had gone this way... It would have taken out everything in that town yep. and just brought it all to the ground. And you can see the damage pictures are probably from just this one little spot right here. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's still really sad, but wow, this would have, I think it only killed about eight people. Um, I can imagine that if it actually went through El Reno altogether, it, it would have, it would have killed a lot more. Um, all right. So back to, uh, back to here. Um, I put another link. Oh, yeah, this was cool. Someone made a simulation of that tornado forming. This is on YouTube. So they, uh, this is a computer model of the formation of this tornado. And it's just kind of mesmerizing to watch. Uh, but this, this whole band in the middle here is what's known as a supercell. So you have very, very fast rising air. And then it reaches an area in the upper atmosphere where the wind is going in a different direction. And that's what throws some rotation into it. And so then it can, the, whole, the whole mass of that air can begin rotating and you end up starting to, to form a tornado. But it's actually just kind of scary looking at the simulation. Yeah. I'm thinking that the atmosphere can do this and it can, it can really form something, something that devastating with 300 mile per hour winds. Oh, you can see the rotation in this. I like how they did this. Oh, cool. That looks that looks really cool. So again, the people that are um, that are clicking the link that have my slides, um, you will um, you will be able to to see um, all of these. Did you guys have thunderstorms last night? We did. My dogs were not a fan. No, my kids weren't either. <laughs> well, we were watching the movie downstairs. We couldn't tell if it was the outside or the movie for yeah. a while. It's definitely outside. Yeah. How cool is this simulation? I just it's want to really keep watching cool. this. All right, I'm going to let, I'll let other people watch that on their own time because not everyone might be as interested as, uh, as I am. Um, okay, so the last slide that I have before the, the Q&A, uh, I put some links in here for anything that you want to learn more about. Um, this is about how tornado intensity is calculated. There's a whole bunch of good articles about that uh, El Reno tornado. This is about Mount Washington's record wind. This is about the snowfall records that we have. So take a look at these links. Um, I like this little extreme Mount Washington video. It talks a lot about Mount Washington and then a little bit how tornadoes form and also how hurricanes form. So a lot of links for you. Um, and I think I'm gonna I'm gonna start diving in to the questions. Do you want Do you want to add anything, Miss Bonner? Yeah. How about I answer that question about the blizzard of '93? Yeah. Go for it. How, how far south did it snow? Yes. So it snowed in Georgia. They got about 35 inches. In Georgia, got 35 inches. Yep. Oh Alabama gosh. got 13 inches. Wow. The Florida Panhandle got four inches. And then there were snow flurries as far south as Jacksonville, Florida. That's crazy. That's insane. <laughs> yeah, I also read um, that Burlington, Vermont shot down to negative 11 Fahrenheit. This is in mid-March. Wow. Because it was the, the strength of that storm was pulling cold air from Canada down a lot farther than, um, than it typically goes. Um, I think this is about the blizzard of 93 as well, but it's a question about how fast were the wind speeds. And I think we saw that the wind speeds hit about um, 93, oh, that's funny, <laughs> about 93 miles per hour um, in the blizzard of 93. So. It's an easy way to remember that. Yep. Yeah. Oh, but I forgot to. Um, oh. Brendan. <laughs> Brendan, you're making me disable the annotating again. Come on. <laughs> 
Okay, I didn't disable the annotating. Um, Brendan, good question waiting though. Waiting till the end though, Brendan. Yes, so. I I appreciate that. I am gonna <laughs> I am gonna um, get rid of that and clear all drawings. And then I forget how I did this yesterday um, to stop the annotation. So I'll have to I'll have I'm to. I'm sure Brendan knows, but he's not gonna tell you. Brendan, oh yeah. Brennan, can you text me uh, how do I how I stop the annotation? <laughs> <laughs> I'll write it on the screen for you. Huh? Yeah, I know. <laughs> okay. In any case, uh, I'll I'll figure that out as I need to. I think people are gonna play nice for a little bit. Okay, okay so Brennan, um, actually, what was Brennan's question that was up there before I erased it? Um, I think it was something about a tornado. Okay. Or, I don't Brennan, know. Brennan, type, type it in the chat. Um, okay, so let's see. I'm going through the um, uh, the questions here. I'm going to start with Mount Shasta uh, because that's that was where we got started. Um, and so I'll, I'll flip back to whoop, that's another annotation. What? You're annotating. I am. Oh, I gotta like, I gotta go back to mouse. Okay, so now I'm confused. <laughs> All right, so Mount Shasta. Uh, okay, so then. Have there ever been surprise avalanches? Yes, all the time. And it kills people. And that's why they, they want to do them not surprise. They want to actually trigger them. But yeah, they get surprise avalanches all the time. So this, this um, photo was taken in a spot called Avalanche Gully for a reason. Uh, because they get avalanches there all the time. Okay. Um, Sophia asked, why do they get this much snow? And it's, it's their location, it's where they are relative to the ocean and the elevation. So um, I'm going to show you on a map where Mount Shasta is. So I want to see in Google Maps here, and you can see how close it is to the ocean. Um, so they're going to get a lot of moisture that's coming off of the water. And it's not, it's not too, too far from the Pacific Ocean. So storms will come off of the Pacific Ocean and then they'll bump into this 14,000 foot mountain. So when it does that, as we know, it's colder at the top of the mountain, so all that rain would fall as snow. So that's a, that is a great question. But yeah, Mount Shasta, because of its proximity to the ocean, that's why. Um, Daniela asked, how was Mount Shasta formed? Excellent question, I meant to say, it's a, it's a volcano. Um, can you figure out which type of volcano it is? It's probably a composite, but I'm not 100% sure. Yep. I would guess composite, but I'll look it up. It looks like a composite. Oh, Mrs. Guerra time chimed in that it is a composite. Oh, thank All you, right. Mrs. Guerra. <laughs> Welcome. All right, Brendan figured it out. Oh, Brendan, you want to ask a question? I will unmute you. Um, okay, Brendan's going to be someone that's going to ask a uh, question not muted. All right, Brendan, you have the floor. Wrong. I was going to tell you how to disable annotation so oh. that I don't have to type out something really long. Oh, okay. How do I do that? So, um, in your toolbar, there should be next to the annotate button, there should be something that says more. Uh, I figured it so out. So you yep. click that annotation settings, and then it says allow slash disable participants annotation. Thank you, Brennan. I got Welcome. it. I appreciate it. I will go back to unmuting you. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so moving on. Uh, thank you, Brennan. Um, so let's see. Um, going through the questions. Um, oh, okay. Why wasn't the snowstorm in Mount Shasta considered a hurricane? And it's because it wasn't tropical. It would need to be a tropical um, storm to be a hurricane. Um, I think we're moving right along. And we are on to the... Oh, looks like... A climate change question. Does climate change have any effect on why most of the recent, uh, the records are recent storms? Absolutely. Oh, I'm in annotate mode again. Um, absolutely, it has a huge effect. So one of the major impacts of climate change is they make these powerful storms more likely. And the reason for that is actually pretty simple. So basically, if you make the atmosphere warmer, you're putting energy into the atmosphere. Energy equals storm. So basically, the warmer you make the atmosphere, the stronger you make the storms. And so that is why a lot of these storms have been have been due to climate change, uh, or at least more likely because of climate change. There's actually a second reason for that, too. Um, the second reason is that 
warmer air is able to hold more water. So as you make the air warmer, you are increasing the amount of water that actually can be held by it. Okay, um, for people that are still with me, and we've got 39 people on Zoom, uh, I just wanna let you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna end the um, Q&A at 1245 at the latest, unless I'm done earlier than that. And then we're gonna play the GIM kit that I put together for this. And so, so stick around for the GIM kit. The GIM kit is coming out by request because we played a Kahoot last time and some people told me um, that they would have rather played a GIM kit. So I made a GIM kit for this one. Okay, um, Daniela asked a really good one. Why didn't Hurricane Harvey move more? Um, that's a good question that I don't actually know the answer to. Um, it probably has to do with the nearby high pressure systems because high pressure systems can block low pressure systems from moving. So it's probably due to the other atmospheric conditions nearby, the low pressure and the high pressure nearby. Um, and let me see if I can confirm that really quick because I can pull up this Null School Earth link from Harvey. Yeah. And so here's Hurricane Harvey and I'm gonna put it into the pressure map. So, and let's see as I move forward if there is a strong high pressure system nearby. Not as strong as I would have guessed. It looks like there is a strong high pressure system here and there's another low pressure system here. So um, my guess is maybe, my second guess would be a weak jet stream, which we can see by looking up at the upper level moisture in the atmosphere, or, or sorry, the upper level winds. And so if I look at the upper level winds, no, not a, not a weak jet, not a, a different jet stream either. So maybe it was this high pressure system here. You can see the clockwise rotation, this is a high. So it could have been this, but this would be a question to research more. Do you know, Ms. Bonner, why it didn't move more? I am not sure. Yeah, that would be a good one for us to, to research. Um, let's see. Uh, Sarah asked a good question, like why, why do tornadoes last for a short period of time and not longer periods of time? And it's because there's not enough energy in the atmosphere to maintain that kind of power. So that um, as soon as the air stops rising as much, or as soon as the ground cools down enough that we don't have all that rising air, the tornado will die out. Uh, so it needs to it, it needs a power source to keep powering it. And to power something that is as big as a tornado, you need a really intense source of power. So that's a really good question. Um, okay, moving on. And a uh, question about tsunamis. Um, most damaging tsunami that has ever occurred. So just a quick point about tsunamis, they are not weather, they're caused by earthquakes, uh, but it, it would have been that Christmas day tsunami that, that hit, um, do you remember which countries those hit, that hit? Do you remember the one that killed like uh, 250,000 people? Oh, Miss Bonner has, uh, has left the room. <laughs> there is a, there's a really big tsunami that, that killed about 200 to 250,000 people. Um, I can't remember, it was on Christmas day, back in, I think, 2007. Um, you can look that one up. But yeah, that would, that would be the most devastating tsunami. Uh, what do the colors represent? I think this, this probably refers to uh, the, that hurricane. And the colors in this are, are referring to the, um, the convective energy of it. So like how fast the air is rising. Uh, so Actually, this one, no, sorry, this wouldn't be referring to that. My, my apologies. This is referring to uh, how much water is in the air at that spot because it's reflecting the, uh, the infrared radiation. So, so that's a really good question too. Um, let's see. Oh, um, what causes avalanches to grow in, oh, actually, you know what? Um, I will, Dylan, I'm gonna unmute you. Dylan, please ask your question. Okay, um, so, what causes avalanches to grow in height? And also, um, do avalanches have a concentrated center or is it all pretty much just a widespread motion down the hill? So snow wants to flow downhill, uh, just like rain. So it wants, to, it wants to find the lowest point. And if you think about, so say you have, a, say you have five feet of snow piled up. If it all flows into a gully, then basically it's gonna create a bigger pile of snow at the bottom of the gully, and that's gonna cause the height of the snow to actually grow, because it's gonna be all piling up in the middle. And so it's gonna move down wherever the steepest slope is, 
And so they will have like preferentially be riding down wherever is the steep slope, but it will pile up um, based on however much snow you have on the ground. As it, as it piles into the middle, it actually goes up higher and higher and higher. Um, does that answer your question? Yeah. Cool. cool. All right, I will unmute you again, Dylan. Thank you for asking the question. For other people that want to ask their question out loud, um, if you want to, um, if you want to do that, write that in your question, and then I can click on unmute you. Um, Donovan asked me a good question: Is uh, is heavy snowfall technically flooding? It is not. Um, different thing, but yeah, but uh, not technically flooding. Okay. Um, let's see. Can you freeze a tornado? No, because they need heat. They need heat to form. Okay, I'm going down to the, going down to the bottom. Okay, um, I'm gonna unmute um, Brendan for a question. Brendan, go. Hi. So um, you uh, you showed a um, simulation of uh, something that I immediately forgot what it was. So um, in that simulation, it showed the rotation of whatever it was. What did the colors of that represent? Are you talking about that's the one that's the on my screen? That's the question that I right asked now? in my annotation that you deleted. Oh, I know what you're talking about. It was the right. it was the tornado simulation. Yep. Yeah. So what did the colors in that rotation represent? Uh, let's see. That right there. So I think what they're representing here are different areas of rising air. So that it's not just in it's not rising in one spot. Now we I'd have to go into the detail of, of the simulation, but because you can see that it's showing different areas coming together. So basically it's currents of air that are two that are different currents of air mixing. So remember to get a tornado forming, you need to have air starts rising and then it gets pushed along by a different by a different section of air. So, okay. so that's what that's so what. So all of those different colors are just different sections of air. Yeah, exactly. There, okay. it moves as one unit, but you have different. You know, so here we go. Streamwise vorticity current. So there are different currents of air that are coming together in one central spot. Mm. Okay. Okay. Um, Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, let's see if I can. Uh, that tsunami yeah. was in two thousand four. Oh, okay. Now I know why you weren't responding. Somehow you got muted. <laughs> I muted myself and then I couldn't unmute myself. Oh, okay. <laughs> My kids are being loud. <laughs> okay. Uh, so we've got uh, a question coming in from Griffin. Um, why do tornadoes have hail in them? Um, do you want to answer that one? Okay, I'll, I'll go with that one. Um, so tornadoes have hail in them because if the same thing that forms hail is exactly what forms a tornado. Very, very fast, hot rising air. So as it pulls the, the moisture up to higher and higher and higher heights, like we're talking 30, 40,000 feet up, um, it freezes the raindrops even when it's 90 degrees down at the bottom. So it takes a strong updraft to create hail, and it also takes a strong updraft, meaning fast rising air, to create a tornado. So it's the, it's the same process, and that's why you get the two of them together. So if you watch um, tornado videos on YouTube, which are often terrifying, you'll usually see hail going along with those. Okay, so I'm, I'm looking through some other questions. Oh, I think it's actually... Um, it is 45. I'm going to do, I'll do one more question. Um, and um, Emmett, I'm going to have you uh, ask a, a real quick question for us. And you get, the, you get the last question today. I'm going to unmute you. So how come, so if a tornado happens, what, does, what decides its movement? Is it like a tornado moves? Is it like what makes the movement happen and is there any way to predict the movement of a tornado that's a great question it, they've been trying to predict better the movement of them um and as of now we are really not good at predicting the movement of tornadoes because we know why it happens to what, why they move a particular way um yeah. it's something that it's like we can explain it in hindsight so so afterwards we can look at the subtle things that would have pushed it along so little little breezes so you see where my cursor is Imagine mm -hmm. there was a south wind here, like the wind coming from the south. It would kind of push the direction of the tornado that way. But then there might be a small air current, maybe a breeze from the north over here, and it pushes the whole tornado this way. 
the problem is because they're only, most tornadoes are only about 500 to 1,000 feet wide. So it only takes a little breeze to be able to push it on its way. And that makes it really difficult to be able to predict where they're going to go because it could just so take a little breeze. So do larger tornadoes move less? They will move less. Yep. Yeah, they'll move in a more consistent path. If you look at the whole path of this El Reno tornado, you can see how it moved around more until, it's, until it became big. And then it basically moved in kind of a straight line from the time that it got big. So the bigger the tornado is, the harder it is going to be to move it. Um, now, the problem is the bigger the tornado is, yes, we can predict its movement a little better, but it's going to do more damage. So unfortunately, we don't have the technology to predict how they move in real time. Mr. Guerra, my brother says hi. Oh, hi, Wes. <laughs> All right, so uh, I think what we'll do, it's uh, 47 past. And um, if you have other questions that I didn't get to, uh, my apologies. If, they are, if they're going to gnaw away at you, um, then please email me, and I will email you back uh, with, uh, with some answers to those. And I'm going to, I'm going to mute everyone temporarily. Um, thank you all for participating in this. Once I, once I end the YouTube stream, what I'm going to do is I'm going to unmute everyone that's still on Zoom. And I'm going to try to leave you all unmuted during the, uh, the Gim Kit game as well, just because I think it would be more fun for you guys to be able to see each other and talk to each other during the Gim Kit game. And it's just for fun anyway, so, so I might as well leave you unmuted. Um, if you're being a pain, I will mute you. Okay, right, so let's, uh, I'm going to end the YouTube stream. Thank you all for watching on YouTube. I hope you enjoyed this. Um, and we will uh, pick this up more on Zoom.